We all fear the regulations. We all feel that the politicians will destroy our crypto space. Is DeFi the solution to this problem or are they going to destroy it? Does it look so bad as we feel it? Well, I have invited my newest guest to talk about this and how decentralized exchanges can solve many of today's problems. My guest today is Charles, CEO of DYDX Foundation. And of course, we will talk about DYDX itself, Charles' history, his background, and why DYDX exchange is better, why is it different, and of course, a little disclaimer. Remember that DYDX is the sponsor of today's episode, so if you have any problems with that, please leave now. Don't waste your time. Having that said, let's begin. As I have mentioned in the introduction, my guest today is Charles from DYDX, CEO of DYDX. Hello, Charles. How are you? Very good morning, Mike. Thanks for having me. Very excited about this conversation. Yeah, I'm happy to have you here. So let's begin. And I would like to ask you about your story. Who are you and uh, how did you join this crypto space? What are you doing here? Sure. So my name is Charles. I'm the CEO of the DYDX Foundation. I started my journey in 2011, buying my first Bitcoin on the Chinese eBay. Uh, I was basically coming from peer-to-peer -peer file sharing and one friend of mine shared with me um, the Bitcoin white paper, which was talking about peer-to-peer -peer money. So I understood peer-to-peer. -peer. I thought I was understanding money, but actually uh, this mix of peer-to-peer -peer and money, uh, which, which is Bitcoin, was something of a rabbit hole for me. So I started my journey in 2011 with uh, with Bitcoin. Uh, I took a break after that and then came back in crypto in 2015, 16 with uh, the birth of Ethereum and the smart contracts. After that, uh, I worked for the Hong Kong government uh, as head of fintech. So I was really at the uh, at the center of uh, reshaping an international financial center into uh, a fintech hub. And uh, within this uh, this kind of missions I had with uh, within the government, one of the the vertical I was in charge was blockchain. Uh, so I spent a lot of time on blockchain. That was a topic I liked quite a lot uh, uh, at the time. Then I joined uh, Consensus as a company behind MetaMask, which many of you probably know. Uh, so I was head of Asia for Consensus. Later on, global head of BizDev. Uh, so I've been working a lot on the development of MetaMask globally, um, but specifically on Asia, working also on CBDCs with uh, a number of central banks. Uh, and uh, fast forward, I joined the DYDX Foundation about a year and a half plus ago now. And uh, the DYDX Foundation is focusing on essentially growing the ecosystem around DYDX, uh, around the DYDX chain, around the DYDX open source code, uh, DYDX is today the world's largest uh, decentralized exchange, uh, which focuses exclusively on PERPs, uh, so perpetuals, which is one of the most popular way to essentially express your opinion on markets. Yeah, so you have a very professional background. Uh, I joined in 2017, so <laughs> long, mm -hmm. long after you've joined this crypto space. Uh, and by the way, what do you think about the CBDCs? Is it as a big dangerous thing as people think, or it's just another form of currency? That's a great question. Money has been evolving over the, the centuries many, many, many times. We started with uh, shells, and then we use salt, and then we use gold, and then we use paper check, and then we use paper money, and now CBDCs are coming. So I think it's uh, an important question, and we, we need to be uh, I would say vigilant on how the CBDCs will, will come to existence. Uh, but the reality is in most countries, uh, CBDCs will, will come to birth and will start to exist in countries where there is uh, a lot of clarity and very strong frameworks uh, around privacy. Uh, so it's not the case everywhere. Uh, each country has its own relationship with privacy. Each country has its own framework around ownership of data and sharing of data. Um, but I don't think uh, CBDCs are 
uh, as dangerous as some people claim. The reality today is there is already uh, a certain level of privacy which is not available with money unless you use cash only. Uh, there is no privacy with money. If you use your credit card or if you use mobile phone wallet, uh, the police can, uh, after filling a few forms and getting some administrative procedures, they can basically uh, get to know everything about your transaction. So the money is traceable already today. Uh, possibly CBDCs will make it even more easily traceable. But coming back to my other points, uh, where CBDCs will exist, they will have to fit with, uh, with privacy and data uh, laws. Uh, and I don't see these laws changing too fast because of, of CBDCs. So eventually, I think it's a good thing for our space. It means that digital assets and the distributed systems such as blockchain are making their way into the government infrastructure. Each government has its own ways to build uh, infrastructure for for, for for their money and, and CBDCs will come in different flavors. Some of them will be uh, very open and, uh, and free. Some others will be a little bit more restricted. But eventually, uh, the market today is a global market for currencies. And if you design uh, a CBDC in a way which is too restrictive, uh, your currency will fall out of fashion. And, and, and essentially, uh, your country will not benefit from it uh, uh, the, the commerce, the global commerce will, will migrate to currencies which are better distributed than, uh, than, than a CBDC with, with too many restrictions. So eventually, it's, uh, I think it's a, a blessing on our technology. Uh, people should remain vigilant on CBDCs, but also welcoming this new form of, uh, of money. Yeah, like you've said, uh, we have to stay vigilant because devil's in the details. So, so yeah, we will see. Uh, they warned us about China, and as far as I know, no one is forcing anyone to use CBDC. So, if China is not is not forcing anyone, so maybe the euro won't force people or other states. So, now let's move to DYDX because it's not a very popular in uh, in Poland. So, can you tell me more about DYDX? And you are the CEO, so you're the boss. Thank you. So yeah, I'm the CEO of the DYDX Foundation. DYDX is an open source uh, software and uh, a permissionless chain today. Uh, but to come back to the history of DYDX, DYDX is the one of the oldest DeFi exchange in the industry today. Uh, DYDX was founded in 2018 uh, by a former Coinbase engineer named Antonio Giuliano. Um, and DYDX started this story focusing on derivatives market, which is the largest market in crypto. Some people might not be aware of that, but every time there is one Bitcoin or one ETH being traded on crypto exchanges, centralized exchanges or decentralized exchanges, what we call the spot market, the derivative market is 10 times bigger than spot market. So if you see for one day, for example, $10 million on Uniswap uh, of trading of some meme coin, you can imagine that there is $100 million, 10 times more, being traded on derivatives. So DYDX was born around the derivative markets uh, since 2018 and has been evolving years after years and today is a world leader decentralized exchange for crypto derivatives. So DYDX started on Ethereum layer one. DYDX later on was one of the very, very early users of layer two. Uh, with uh, the version 3 of DYDX being built on Starknet uh, using, uh, yeah, using the software, this uh, open source software for, for layer 2. And DYDX migrated last December to its own chain, the DYDX chain built out of the Cosmos SDK. So from a, from a technology perspective, the engineering teams behind DYDX have always been very chain agnostic and essentially upgrading the protocol with the best technology available with a single focus on the best uh, trading experience for, for its user. So today, DYDX uh, daily volume are between one to two billion US dollar. Um, and uh, there is uh, a lot of activity on the DYDX chain on the, on the top of which uh, essentially users are expressing their opinion. So since uh, the DYDX chain was born, about uh, 70 billion US dollar of, of trading has been happening. And the people staking on DYDX, so if you want to participate in the security of the DYDX chain, you can stake DYDX tokens. And when you stake DYDX token, you receive 
USDCs. Uh, these USDCs are coming from the trading fees paid by the users of the protocol. So when people express their opinion on the market and use the DYDS exchange to trade derivatives, they pay their fees uh, in USDC. And 100% uh, of the trading fees are distributed to stakers and validators. So that's also a very unique staking experience uh, to consider uh, staking on, on the DYDX chain. It's an app chain, so the DYDX chain is dedicated only to DYDX. And it's also, uh, uh, as I mentioned, hosting the world largest uh, decentralized exchange for crypto derivatives. Uh, let me uh, let me ask you if I got, got this right. So you started on Ethereum layer 2, then you moved to Tarknet, and now you are in a Cosmos ecosystem using yeah. uh, probably IBC, right? Exactly. So it's very easy to start using uh, start using because I know a lot of people are using uh, Cosmos. It's very easy and user friendly. So it's like uh, transferring coins from one chain to another. Uh, so you recently migrated to version four and became fully decentralized, right? Ex exactly. So the reason we built our own chain on the Cosmos SDK and the DYDX chain is to essentially progressing further in terms of decentralization. In the world of decentralized exchanges, the reality is there is always some components which cannot sit on chain. Uh, if you are an order book type of exchange like DYDX is, uh, no chains is ever capable of supporting tens of thousands of, uh, uh, of uh, transactions per second to maintain an order book uh, updated. Uh, so the goal of DYDX was always to kind of leverage all the best technologies available at any point in time to keep progressing uh, in terms of decentralization. So on the previous version of DYDX, sitting on Ethereum layer two, the order book was off chain, sitting on the AWS server. This upgrade of the DYDX software and the open sourcing of the DYDX software and the birth of the DYDX chain allows today the DYDX uh, uh, experience to be fully decentralized with the order book sitting on the RAM memory of the uh, of the validators. So people can come and connect on DYDX with their MetaMask wallet. They can come and connect with uh, more than 20 plus wallets and start to express their opinions on more than 50 different perpetual, uh, perpetual trading markets. Uh, should it be on crypto native um, uh, markets, but there is also governance. So you can vote on which market you would like to see coming on the exchange. And, uh, and then the community can essentially express its opinion and uh, kind of help the, the protocol and the software to upgrade itself as well as launching new features. So over the past 90 days, more than 20 markets have been voted and decided by the community. So it's a very unique experience when actually if you go on a centralized exchanges, you can only trade and there is a black box and you trade and and uh, and that's all you you just have to wait for new features to be released by the by the centralized exchanges. When you come to decentralized exchanges such as uh, DYDX, not only you can participate in the security of the uh, of the chain by staking uh, DYDX token if you decide to, but you can also vote and express your opinion on which new market should be launched, uh, what kind of new feature should be added, um, and this is something which uh, the DYDX community and the 15,000 stakers are, are, are keeping very close to their heart and, and really putting energy and their talents in, in making what DYDX is today as uh, the world's largest uh, crypto perps uh, exchange. Yeah, you've mentioned earlier that uh, there is a DYDX Trading Incorporated and there is the DYDX uh, Foundation. What are the differences between the, those two entities? Absolutely. So if you if you map the ecosystem of DYDX today, there is uh, eventually about four entities. The first entity is DYDX Trading, the original company behind the DYDX software. This company is based out of New York and is led by uh, Antonio Giuliano and they are focusing on producing open source software. This open source software is then uh, essentially deployed by validators and uh, managed by the community. So the first entity, DYDX Trading out of New York. Second entity is the DYDX Foundation. I'm the CEO of the DYDX Foundation. We have a team of more than uh, 20 people today. 
uh, we were uh, we receive a, um, uh, we did a fundraising exercise uh, a few months ago uh, together with a uh, with the community treasury and the community treasury allocated more than 30 million US dollars to the foundation for the next three years for us to keep helping the ecosystem to grow. Uh, the third and fourth uh, entities to uh, pay attention to within the ecosystem of DYDX are the uh, DYDX Grants DAO. So the DAO was created by the community and essentially found different projects and initiatives to help the DYDX chain to keep upgrading itself and performing well, as well as the DYDX Operation DAO. Uh, which is running some core services for the chain, such as indexers and front end and, and, and some others. But beyond these four entities within the decentralized ecosystem of DYDX, there is hundreds, if not thousands, of people working uh, either as contributors, uh, community members, ambassadors, validators. There is more than 60 active valid active validators from multiple countries and all these teams are essentially contributing to the liveness uh, of the chain and and, and uh, the liveness of the dydx ecosystem so a totally decentralized ecosystem uh, really aligned with uh, the DeFi, i would say uh, uh, principles with uh, uh, a series of different entities essentially uh, contributing each each others uh, on the on the protocol itself to make it the, the leader today for um, uh, for perpetual derivatives. Yeah. By the way, as far as, far as I know, version three was working very well. Uh, so why did you move to version four? It's like moving the liquidity from one chain to another. Why do it? It's basically. Um, I think it was a decision for the identity of DYDX uh, and for the long-term ex executions on the long-term vision. DYDX has been always um, very clear and very focused on one thing only, which is crypto derivative. We talked about that. Uh, DYDX has also this commitment as a, as a community to keep improving decentralization of the software. So DYDX version three, as I was mentioning, was running on a layer two, but the order book, which is where the buyers and the sellers orders are, meet, are meeting, was not on chain. This order book was off chain on an AWS server because no layer two can essentially host uh, the, the velocity of, of an order book moving between one to two billion per day. So the reason of this migration was to stick to the principles of decentralization and as soon as there is technology available to upgrade the software and progress in terms of decentralization and decentralizing one of the last piece which is the order book and a very important one and making this decentralized that was a way for 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 dydx to express much more clearly and in a much more opinionated way what means the fight for dydx and and why moving when actually, as you mentioned, V3 has been extremely successful and working extremely well as well. But there was still this, um, I would say, this kind of uh, 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 box of decentralization, which was not ticked for the engineers. So uh, when the DYDX chain was, uh, uh, I would say, possible to, to build uh, by the DYDX engineers and, and, and validators and the community rally together to build the DYDX chain, it was time for uh, for DYDX to upgrade itself uh, into a new version of itself, totally decentralized, and that is uh, that is uh, the DYDX chain. So now even the order book is decentralized. Absolutely, and that's very important. I give you one example today. If you go trading on a centralized exchange, let's say Binance, Kraken, Coinbase, any any centralized exchange is more or less the same architecture. You are trading against a black box. You have no idea what's happening. Who is behind on the other side of the trade? Is it the exchange itself trading against you? Is it someone yeah. else? You have absolutely no idea. And you can only take good assumptions, but basically it's a black box. And why, why you want to go to DeFi is to make sure that your market is healthy. You want to make sure that you get a market which is uh, a fair market, where if you come and express your opinion, if you come and trade, you don't want to, to trade against someone which have more information than you, or maybe cutting corners, right? So when you come to the DYDX uh, version 4, the DYDX chain, the order book is actually totally open. You, you know exactly what's happening. 
you get the same liquidity, you get the same efficiency in terms of order execution, you get the right to vote and accelerate the launch of new market and the YDX will be launching uh, by this summer more than 200 new markets and possibly up to 500 new markets. So suddenly the experience and the alignment between the protocol, the DeFi protocol itself, the YDX, and the users, which possibly are token holders, the alignment becomes extremely um, healthy and extremely positive. Suddenly, the users have a way to express themselves on which market they want to see. They have a way to understand how the product works totally. So it's uh, it's something which seems obvious, but many people do, do not realize yet that when you get like the comfort of a centralized exchange, sometimes it comes with very important trade-offs. You lose the custody of your coin. So if you if you want to trade on a centralized exchange, you send your coins to this centralized exchange. Sometimes they take good care of your coins. Sometimes they run away with it. Sometimes they do bankrupt. I think we have enough examples of that yeah. and we don't have to remember too late, right? So if you trade a little bit of money, that's kind of probably okay. Uh, but if you start to be successful, you want to think, okay, where do I exactly trade? Uh, what is exactly the risk I'm taking right now? And and if you if you reach this level of trying to understand how you 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 go and trade and express yourself on, on the markets. DeFi is something which is much more healthy and is essentially the future of finance. This is where everything will be going. Um, so when you trade on DeFi and DYDX, you don't send your funds to DYDX. This is non-custodial. There is no way DYDX or the validators or anyone runs away with a, uh, with a, uh, with essentially your, your deposit. All of this is made on chain and totally uh, in a totally transparent way. Same for the order book. When you trade on the order book, you can see exactly what's happening. Uh, so that's very positive for the re for the users. Should they be uh, retail users, but also power users? Uh, DYDX is also very popular with institutional traders, hedge funds, uh, the bot traders as well, because they can see that it's non-custodial. They can see that there is an order book type of exchange it's not an AMM. An AMM will make like, uh, probably a lot of slippage when you trade as well as a, a very different trading experience as soon as you trade some volumes. Uh, so the order book is actually the most efficient uh, price discovery mechanism. That's why all the centralized exchanges are essentially order book type of exchanges. Uh, so there is a series of, of benefits uh, for, for users to essentially rethink when they use uh, centralized exchanges and 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 explore further why um, why DeFi makes sense and maybe maybe just one closing note uh, on this uh, on this question uh, you know the spot market when you buy physically uh, tokens if uh, if or any, uh, any uh, ERC twenties the spot market used to be exclusively on centralized exchanges, the yeah. Binance, the Coinbase of the world. About four years ago, uh, Uniswap uh, came to life and Uniswap started from zero. Four years later, Uniswap represents between 10 to 15% of the global spot trading volume. Today, DYDX represents one to 2% of the global perps volumes and about 98% of the perps, the de crypto derivative trading volumes are happening on centralized exchanges. So there is a massive growth and there is a massive, in my opinion, uh, an upcoming migration away from centralized exchanges to DeFi for the crypto derivative market. And that's a very important one because the crypto derivative markets are 10 times bigger than spot market. And they have a very strong influence in the overall uh, uh, price discovery and, and, and crypto markets globally. Yeah, and there is a one thing about uh, centralized exchanges. Uh, when the price is pumping or dumping, they can always say, we, are, we apologize for your inconvenience. Our system is offline. We are <laughs> working as fast okay. as we can to fix it. And then, of course, you cannot, you cannot earn. It happened a lot. Some of the centralized exchanges are just bucket shops because they trade against you. And then one more thing, let's say you've been successful, you've earned a lot of money and then the AML process starts and okay, we have to verify a thing. Where did you get your money from? Like 
Why do you ask me that? I did it on your exchange. No, no, no. <laughs> it doesn't matter. We have to check it. And then you wait and you wait and you wait. I heard a lot of, of people who had to fight with them or even uh, or even ask the lawyers to uh, to mail them or contact them. It takes a lot of time. And, there, and then you have decentralized exchanges where you just use your wallet and there is no third party. So so it's very 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 important but i would ask you you are, next question is about your token dydx token why do you need it what are the benefits because you've mentioned staking but everyone can say okay i have staking why do you need it what are the benefits absolutely so the, the dydx token was born in 2021 it existed first on the ethereum side as a governance only token uh, with the birth of the dydx chain uh, last december as uh, the DYDX token became uh, a totally new token, a utility token. So essentially, users of DYDX or token holders of DYDX can decide to stake their DYDX token to secure the chain. So they pick one validator and they stake the DYDX token. When you stake DYDX token, you do not receive DYDX. When you stake the YDX token, you receive USDCs. These USDCs are coming from the trading fees of the protocol. So when an exchange protocol like DYDX uh, runs uh, and move about one to two billion US dollar of trading volume every day, uh, the users of DYDX essentially pay trading fees in USDCs. And 100% of the trading fees are essentially distributed uh, on, a, on, a, on a minute basis uh, to the DYDX stakers and DYDX validators. So that's a very unique staking experience. If you have been a Bitcoin miner in the past, if you are an Ethereum staker uh, today, uh, usually you basically, uh, if you stake Ethereum, you get Ethereum tokens. If you stake Atom, you get Atom tokens. If you stake Osmo, you get Osmo. And most of these tokens have an inflation. So basically you get maybe 10% rewards, but actually in real terms, you might have only 1.5% or 2% the rest being inflation from the token. Yeah. On the DYD exchange, it's very different experience. And for me, having uh, the chance to, to stake quite a few things along uh, uh, along the past years, staking DYDX is very unique. You, you stake DYDX, uh, you're staking into an app chain. This app chain is the world largest uh, decentralized uh, protocol for perps. And what you get as rewards are the fees of the protocol. So the fees and the, the APR is not defined by a mathematic formula. We cannot tell you if you stake on DYDX, you're going to get 10% or 15%. This essentially APR varies every day, depending on the trading volume. So when there is a lot of volatility, people are trading a lot, they pay a lot of fees, the, valid the stakers and validators get more fees in USDC. And when you receive the USDC, you don't have to think, oh my God, this, this coin, I need to stake it again or I need to sell it quickly because there is such a high inflation. Yeah. This is USDC. USDC has also inflation, the US dollar has inflation, but it's a very different type of, uh, of rewards uh, that, uh, that you can get staking the DYDX uh, tokens on the DYDX chain. It's fairly easy. You can start staking from one DYDX only and, uh, and start receiving uh, your, uh, your rewards in USDC uh, the minute after. Yeah, there's a joke about US dollar because it's yeah, it has a lot of inflation, but uh, it has very strong validators like US Army, US Marines, <laughs> yeah, and things like that. And uh, inflation wise is very, very good thing. I've just checked and I see the YDX is uh, has maximal supplies of 1 billion. That's why you pay fees in and uh, rewards in USDC because mm -hmm. you can produce dydx indefinitely there's a max supply. yeah and then i think it's a great solution because you get usdc and you can do anything with this usdc you want you can buy more dydx and stake more and those those fees come from traders so it's like you have a product product earns earns money and then stakers get usdc as a reward of staking so very good solution in my opinion uh, by the way, one more question. Uh, I would like to ask you about DAO uh, because you have the governance of version 4. What does the DAO do? Uh, you've mentioned that uh, 
the community can ask about more trading pairs. So what are the other things that DAO does? Absolutely. So there is a grants DAO. The grants DAO receive money from the community treasury. The DYDX community sits on about 700 million US dollars of value today. And they can, the community can vote and allocate budget to different DAOs. As I mentioned earlier, there is two DAOs today in the ecosystem. The first one is a grants DAO. They support projects building on DYDX, uh, where the users can essentially uh, express their opinion uh, is via the general governance uh, of DYDX. So uh, DYDX today uh, allows users to essentially list markets by themselves. Uh, so there is within the DYDX interface uh, a subsections for listing new markets and people can choose markets they would like to vote on. Over the past 90 days, as I mentioned earlier, more than 20 new markets were voted and approved uh, by the DYDX community. And there is an upgrade of DYDX coming up, which essentially will uh, upgrade the, uh, the price oracles. So the price oracle systems will, will allow the protocol to list uh, uh, much, uh, a much bigger number of, of new markets, allowing uh, to, to, to list, for example, markets listed on, on, on decentralized spot exchanges, uh, possibly some uh, real world asset or maybe some uh, pre-market tokens. So tokens we do not exist yet, but if people want to start to trade them, they will be able to do that most probably. Uh, so all of this is possible via the governance and via the, essentially the DAOs allowing people to vote on, um, on, on, on the direction the protocol should be going. So the process is fairly simple. Most of the time people meet and discuss via the DYDX forum. So uh, people can connect to uh, www.dydx forum. And then people will start a conversation saying, oh, we would like to list uh, together as a community this new market or this new market. And within a few days, some analysis, some exchange happen within the community. And eventually a vote uh, is put uh, for the community uh, to vote on. And within a few days, a vote goes through its cycle. And after the, after the vote is accepted or not, uh, and if the vote is accepted, uh, the market is listed within uh, 60 minutes. So it's a very high velocity system. It's a very different experience. Just imagine if you are a user of Binance and you want a new market, you have to go on Twitter, you have to go on, on forums, you have to go everywhere and pray, 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 and shout, shout, shout. Uh, on the DYDX community, it's basically you rally as many people as you can uh, around your, your ID. You try to build and shape your ID so it has legs and it's, uh, it's well, uh, well, uh, well thought. And then very quickly, you can ask everyone from the community to express their opinion on this new market and potentially list it. Community first. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Uh, one more question. I would not like to go much into technical details, but you have um, you have validators in your network. So can anyone, let's say I want to become a validator. Is it like a closed list and I have to wait on the wait list or I can just uh, meet the requirements and become the validator DYDX? That's a great question, Mike. Thank you for asking. So today there is a, a protocol limit of 60 active validators on DYDX. If you want to be a validator on DYDX, it's totally permissionless. You don't need to be on the list. You don't need to have an agreement with everyone or with anyone. You just need to essentially uh, fulfill the requirement of the chain. So you need to be uh, within the top 60 validators in terms of staking size, and then you will become active. Uh, so you can download the open source software from the DYDX GitHub, uh, install this in your machine, uh, bring together enough DYDX tokens, so today, I think the minimum should be around 2,000 DYDX token to be within the active set. And then as soon as you can be in the active set, you will just happen to be in the active set. Uh, then you will need to perform well. And then if, if you don't perform well enough, the, the protocol will jail you if you don't do uh, if you don't have a good behaviors. But most of the people are, are doing the right things, to be honest. Um, but it's a permissionless chain, so you don't really need to ask anything. There is documentation available. Uh, and it's just a, a little bit of a competition between yeah. uh, candidates of being validators. Uh, it's, uh, it's a short list of 60, but there is a full list of 150. No one decides who goes active and non-active. 
It's just you apply the rules, and if you are within the top 60, you're active. If you're within the bottom 60 or the bottom 80, uh, you become inactive until you bring enough DYDX tokens. Uh, so that's uh, that's basically how the, the rule works, and uh, it allows today uh, a multitude of validators uh, to to come and, and and support the chain. What is very important and and kind of interesting when you look at the DYDX ecosystem, within the sixty active validators of DYDX, you you find I would say the usual suspects of the uh, of uh, of Cosmos validators. Uh, so some validators and teams which are very active in the Cosmos space. But you see also a lot of institutionals and very professional validators uh, which are coming, for example, from the centralized crypto exchanges. So you can see OKX having a validator on DYDX. You can see Coinbase having a validator on DYDX also. Uh, and you will probably see some more in the coming uh, in the coming weeks. So it's a very interesting ecosystem where users, OGs, engineers, and also centralized exchanges are kind of uh, meeting each other and compete uh, with each other to to secure and maintain the DYD exchange. And maybe my very last point is, um, maybe one of your follow-up questions could be, why 60 validators and why not 250 or more? And the reality, to be a little bit technical, uh, DYDX is not a, a general purpose blockchain. Uh, it's not uh, it's not uh, an Ethereum or a Cosmos hub blockchain. It's really uh, an application chain. So DYDX is existing only to for the DYDX use case. Uh, so when you when you when you build and design from an engineering perspective an app chain, an application chain, you don't think of all the same parameters the same way. Uh, so. Uh, that's why the limit of the protocol is to 60 validators now, is to guarantee that there is a full consensus between all the validators very quickly, so that the performance of the application on the top is really uh, is really a high performance and fast. If you were to have too many validators, uh, the time for the consensus to get to be to be rich amongst all these validators will maybe bring the block time to maybe two, three, four, five seconds which will make the experience for the user of the chain uh, really not optimal. So there is a balance uh, to find here, and you don't need to decentralize um, an application chain the same way you decentralize Bitcoin yeah. or Ethereum or some other chain. Every application have its, have its own degree. All of these parameters can be decided and adjusted by, by the governance and the community, but today the consensus is to really be aligned with what DYDX chain is, it's an application chain and it should bring a minimum level of decentralization, a sufficient level of decentralization, but keeping also the performance of the chain up to standard so the experience for the end users is optimal. Yeah, Bitcoin has uh, <coughs> 10 minutes block time on average, so that's not a problem, but with, when you have a faster blocks, you have to think about that and being in the consensus, so yeah, you're perfect. Absolutely. Right. All right. Uh, Let's move to another question. I would like to ask you about your competition. It's not like you're <laughs> working in a vacuum. So, so do you? Who do you consider a competition? And uh, is it like you, you check their efforts and improve on that? Absolutely. The DYD as a DYDX. Uh use case is crypto derivative as i mentioned crypto derivative is the world largest crypto market it's bigger than spot uh by by 10x so there is obviously competition and dydx is not on this market uh, alone uh, so it really means that there is a real demand here the advantage of dydx is being focused on crypto derivative only since 2018 so that's why we are where we are today uh, there is competitions. We see some new projects popping up on some layer twos here and there. We pay attention to them, uh, a close attention, as we should, uh, to understand what kind of design decisions do they take, uh, how do they release their tokens. Some of these projects are popular right now because their upcoming tokens are bringing attention from from traders and and, and farmers. Um, I hope they will be able to keep this audience, but maybe this audience will move to another project after uh, after the, the the token has been uh, has been released so this is something we will pay attention to later on but the most important for us is to keep evolving in terms of uh, the way the new market can be served and keep innovating with a very strong focus 
Today, if you want to trade crypto derivatives, DYDX protocol is the best venue if you look at decentralized way to, to do it. So as I mentioned, there is some upgrades coming up. Uh, one of them, which we are very excited about, is uh, the upgrade of the Oracle systems, which will allow DYDX to list an additional 200 to 500 new markets. That's really uh, something the, the users are expecting. So we will need, a, essentially, users will be able to find in DeFi new markets weeks, if not months, before they will appear on centralized exchanges such as Binance, uh, uh, Kraken, or, or some others. So really bringing an, an unfair advantage to DeFi by listing faster new markets. That's number one. And number two, there is also uh, the DYDX Vault, uh, which will be launched in the coming weeks. This was announced a few a few days ago uh, by uh, DYDX Trading, the developer of the open source software, allowing essentially uh, for uh, kicking off the, the liquidity on new market to use some AMM vaults until the market matures. So there is this, uh, these two updates uh, for now, which are very exciting. Uh, the upgrade of the price oracles to list hundreds of new markets, as well as a deep infrastructure upgrade and the launch of this um, liquidity vault to help new market to get kick off. So I think we, we do have co uh, competitions. Uh, we respect our competition as much as they respect us, I think. Uh, but we, we stay, we stay really heads down thinking on how we can stay focused to one single thing and being the best at it is a crypto derivative purpose. Yeah. And my last, <laughs> my last topic for the for today is, uh, challenges and, uh, and threats because we not only both protocol wise and from the regulators <laughs> and it's a very sad day when you have to worry about the regulators and their ideas <clears throat> first let's talk protocol wise because a lot of times we hear uh, we hear okay this uh, this bridge has been hacked this protocol has been hacked and how do you address that things do you guys like have some security team working on that like or maybe some audits uh, how do you face those challenges? That's a great question, Mike. Thank you for that. One thing, there is many positive ways when, when you reach a critical size enough so you can launch your own chain. And after years of having DYDX sitting on someone else's blockchain, mm -hmm. Ethereum layer one and later uh, layer twos, we were able to launch our own DYDX chain. So it comes with more responsibilities, but we are also in control of the full stack. So we control the security of DYDX. We don't have a depend. No one else is in charge of DYDX security. It's the DYDX validators and community only, right? So if we need to do a quick upgrade, if we need to change some piece of software, we can be extremely reactive and essentially upgrading the software very quickly. So obviously, all the software of DYDX is fully audited, but there is a very big difference with someone else. Is we don't rely on someone else for our own security. We, we manage that. We manage the software, we manage the validators or the community itself. We have a full picture and we can be very reactive in terms of security. There is, you can access DYDX via bridges, but most of the people are using DYDX via USDC, for example. So they bring USDC from a noble, noble chain, which is a, a, an adjacent chain from the Cosmos ecosystem. There is many different ways to essentially bring safely uh, your uh, your USDCs to start your, uh, your your trading experience on DYDX via some partners custodians via some partners chain uh, bridges are available as well with Accelar for example but for the most part people are bringing native USDC uh, so that's very important also to see how the our industry overall has been evolving and you don't really need to take the same level of risk as as people were taking some years ago now that essentially the core assets such as USDC in the, in, in the example of DYDX are coming directly on chain in a, in a nat uh, native way. Um, another challenge is a, a very simple challenge to kind of explain, but very hard and ongoing challenge is the talents. Um, it's, uh, we are in a bull run, uh, we are in a very competitive market and bringing enough talents in the core teams bringing enough talents and attentions within the community and making sure that we have the best people from the crypto ecosystem around the DYDX uh, uh, project is for me as a CEO of the DYDX Foundation, a daily challenge. 
making sure we attract and retain the best talents. There is so many things happening everywhere. You want to keep the best people building together with uh, with you, right? So there is many ways to uh, to essentially uh, attract and, and and keep those maintain and maintain this, those talents engaged. But talent is really, I would say, the core. Uh, the core of the uh, the medium term to long term battle. The winners will have the talents. The winners will keep the mind share of the best engineers. Should they be financial engineers or, or technical engineers, that's something which is very close to uh, uh, to to my mind on a, on a daily basis. Then comes regulations. Obviously, uh, decentralized finance is a, a new topic of finance. Uh, it has uh, it has some attentions from the from the regulators. Um, we as a community, should it be different entities within the YDX or community members, are doing some uh, constant efforts of communications and uh, exchange with regulators to make them understand what is DeFi. And I think it's one of our responsibility as um, DeFi practitioners not to claim DeFi is better, but to demonstrate that DeFi actually aligns with the regulators. If you think about it, what, what do the regulators want? Regulators want healthy, transparent market and safety for the funds of the users. There is a few more things they want, but these are the three main items. I want a healthy ecosystem of finance. I want transparency so I can identify when there is someone misbehaving. And I want the, the funds of the users to remain safe. And the good news is DeFi by design since day one offers this as a feature it's not a service in defi it's transparent if you de if you de design defi properly in defi it's also safe uh, the the custody of the users it cannot be mixed with uh, with the funds of the, of the centralized exchanges if you take the example of ftx or many many others yeah. uh, so it's it's our role uh, uh, within the dydx ecosystem and within the defi ecosystem it's a, it's an effort we are doing with uh, with many others to essentially stay engaged with regulators and make them understand that uh, defi actually is software uh, you cannot regulate the technology but you should regulate the operators uh, and that's something that's a kind of a pattern of a uh, of, uh, of regulations, which we have seen in the early days of the Internet back in the 90s, when the regulators have seen the Internet coming, they were thinking, oh, my God, we're going to regulate the Internet and we're going to find the CEO of Internet yeah. and we're going to put regulations on them. But there is no CEO of Internet the same way there is no CEO of, of Bitcoin. It's a technology. So then you, you basically help them to evolve, understanding that this is a technology. You cannot regulate technology, but maybe you should regulate DeFi. And maybe in the near future, we will have DeFi, which will come in different flavors. Maybe American DeFi with a, a kind of American rules. Maybe a Chinese DeFi with Chinese rules. And maybe a European DeFi with, uh, with DeFi rules. But we, we are doing some constant efforts to, to explain. Uh, that essentially the agenda of DeFi and what the regulators wants to achieve are very elegantly overlapping. And we just need to keep uh, the conversation open, keep building bridges to explain. And maybe regulations will be adjacent to DeFi. Um, and maybe that's the path uh, it's, it will be taking. Um, but that's, uh, that's, that's the best for, for having more people to benefit from this efficient uh, finance. A uh, fair finance that is decentralized finance. Yeah, exactly. The regulators have to understand that they have to find the balance between security of the users and their funds and accessibility of the um, of the market. Because if you want to regulate too much, bad actors will always will, will always find a way to avoid the regulations. But normal people will just leave uh, or try to find workarounds. So they have to understand that. Hopefully they will. So uh, and of course, uh, DeFi is quite different uh, because in uh, CeFi you have some bank on Fred, you have Doquan or guys like that. Centralized exchanges failed in many ways and uh, people lost a lot of money. And DeFi is still here and it's your money. You are responsible for your own money because it's your wallet. And I hope they see that. Absolutely. If you think of all the different crises during the FTX crisis, which is a crisis we've seen the, uh, lastly, DeFi was still around and DeFi did not collapse, yeah. even though the market has been going through 
uh, a very intense uh, shake and, and, and type of crisis. The, the smart contract have made everyone whole. Smart contract cannot cheat. Uh, they can have security failures the same way you can have a hack within a central bank. Uh, but uh, there is really more, more fairness and more programmability. So that's that's something which is which is important. The reality, if you look carefully, and as as I mentioned earlier, I spent some time co-building with some governments in the past, some CBDCs, and you look at the CBDC scene, we started to see some central banks using smart contracts also on DeFi. Uh, so they, they might not be using the smart contract in the same environment. This might be on a private blockchain or maybe modifying the smart contract a little bit. But DeFi is making its way within uh, the innovation centers of central banks. Uh, one example coming to mind is an experimentation between central banks of Switzerland, France, and Singapore. And essentially, they did a fork of the uh, AVE and Uniswap smart contract to do some lending and swapping CBDCs between different currencies. So this was made into a private Ethereum blockchain, um, so in a private setting. Yeah. But it shows that actually they are paying attention and they understand that actually you can get like a full and constant uh, audit of what's happening. So if you want to identify something wrong, if you want to block some transactions, if this is uh, the architecture you decide to apply, this is something which can be done uh, via decentralized finance because you can constantly audit what's happening. If you work with a normal bank, you get audits every three months, if you're lucky. And so you realize there was a problem three months after, which is make it very hard uh, to fix it later. Yeah, of course. Uh, my fin final question, uh, let's say some of my viewers want to know more First, they can visit your webpage, but if they want to contact your team or DYDX directly, what approach should they use? Should they go on like forum or email you? What is the way, best way to contact the team if, you have, if they have additional questions? Absolutely. So there is multiple, I would say, uh, doors to join uh, the DYDX community. You can join us and, and connect and follow the latest news from DYDX following uh, uh, DYDX on Twitter, Twitter slash DYDX. You can also join the Discord community, the forum, dydx.forum, uh, the DYDX forum page. Uh, and also there is different uh, front ends. Uh, the DYDX uh, foundation team is focusing on enabling uh, uh, the ecosystem overall. So we're not the operator of the exchange per se, but we definitely keep within the web page of dydx.foundation uh, website, dydx.foundation. It's a very good way for you to start your journey within DYDX, looking at documentation, getting links uh, to the forums, the discords, and different ways and, and different uh, uh, manners to either stake, bridge, or maybe consume the DYDX protocol. So yes, find us on Twitter or start your journey with the, within the DYDX ecosystem via dydx.foundation website. Welcome. Yeah, and you can find all those links links below in the video description. So, Absolutely. So be free to click. Thank you, Charles, for your time. You have. Explained. Thank you so much, Mike. I really appreciate the conversation. Yeah, have a you good have one. Explained everything perfectly. So I have no more questions. So hopefully, let's talk more in the future. See you. Absolutely. Thanks a lot. Cheers.